Hey, I'm Mike Willis with USA Wrestling. We've got another edition of Team USA Tuesday today. I'm joined by world team member Max Nowry. Uh, Max represented the U.S. at the 2019 Worlds at 55 kilograms. Uh, Max, how are you feeling? Today? Doing pretty good. Just trying to stay busy. Um, rehabbing a, after a surgery, but uh, other than that, everything's going pretty good. Awesome. I see you got uh, some some jerseys behind you. Who is uh, uh, Jor Jordan? Obviously, is front and center. Who's on the left and the right? Oh, uh, that's Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman. Um, found those off of my uh, stash when I was a younger kid when my uh, mom brought all my old stuff out here. Right on. So are you still a Bill fan? Uh, no, I, I don't really watch. I don't follow. I follow golf and I follow wrestling and that's about it. Gotcha. I just figured it'd be cool to hang hang something like that, something I found from a long, long time ago. Yeah, no, no, it looks good. <laughs> um, so I got a list of questions for you. Are you ready to hop into them? Yep. All right, let's do it. Starting off, what is your favorite movie? Goodfellas. Goodfellas and uh, Days of Thunder. What was the second one? Days of Thunder. Days of Thunder. I've never heard of that one. What's that? That's a, it's a racing movie with uh, Tom Cruise. Cool. Um, Goodfellas was a quick answer, so you must really like that one. Yeah. I'm, uh, and, and actually, within the last month, I've been watching a lot of just um, mafia mob movies, just uh, something that's always intrigued me. Yeah, good stuff. Well, it's def definitely on the list of classics, <laughs> for sure. Uh, who is your favorite musical artist? John Mellencamp. Uh, grew up listening to him. Uh, my dad got me hooked on him when uh, I was really young, so Mellencamp's always been a favorite of mine. What's your favorite Mellencamp tune? Uh, small Town, obviously. It's, it's a good one. Um, and uh, Without Expression um, and Real Life. Okay. Do you listen to him while you're warming up for matches, or are you not a music guy? Uh, big music guy, but when I'm when I'm at a tournament, uh, it's more rap and um, older Lil Wayne and, and stuff like that, older rap. Um, and then after my matches, when I'm just hanging out in the stands, that's when I'll throw on uh, some John Mellencamp or Bob Seger, something to pull me back down, bring bring down all that energy. So um, yeah, when I'm getting ready to warm up or anything for matches, it tempo's a lot higher. Yeah. <laughs> um... So you already said that your your favorite sport to watch outside of wrestling was golf. Uh, do you have a favorite golfer or uh, you know golfers? Uh, I like Brooks Kepka. Um, and I like to see Tiger do a little bit more towards the end of his his career. Um, I like Rory McIlroy. Um, I don't have like a definite favorite. I just enjoy watching the guys and and. Um, and then, you know, Bryson DeChambeau, if anyone follows golf, you know, he's, he's done a lot of things since COVID, just getting his body bigger. And people were kind of knocking him on that. But if you think like, the way I look at it, because I, I like to mix golf and wrestling together because I, I'm very technical and I like, I like to stick to a lot of little details. Um, you know, he his whole he approached golf in a different way and wanted to get bigger and, and hit the golf ball farther and give himself more in advance. So I, I kind of like his approach. And and following the little things he likes to do. So he's also someone I like to watch. How did you get into golf to begin with? And do you play? Uh, so I played for a summer when I was uh, in, I think, eighth, seventh or eighth grade. My buddy back home, um, best friend growing up, was really, really good at it and um, did it with him on the summers uh, during the summertime with him and his grandpa. Um, so I did it for a summertime and then never picked up a club for 10 years. Went to uh, Alaska because I was coaching their Fargo team and the coaches, uh, we did a two on two kind of scramble and uh, me and my, me and my partner lost to the head coach. And uh, I went home and I told him I was going to buy a set of clubs and come back a lot better next year. And, and because of that, I came home, bought a set of clubs, and got hooked and addicted to it. Very cool. Um, How did you end up becoming uh, Alaska's Fargo coach? So I, 
at basic training, my first sergeant, um, first sergeant Bocker, uh, Wes Bocker, he's, um, he's in charge of the Alaska USA wrestling. Um, and he's got a club up in Fairbanks. So he was my first sergeant. He used to wrestle all army, uh, back a while ago with, with coach Robinson. And he, he knew coach Robinson and Serakis and coach Lewis. So, um, I didn't, we didn't find out about each other until halfway through the, through the basic training cycle. And, um, and we just kept in touch after that. And uh, he, he asked Bruce if, if uh, any of the Army guys um, or myself would like to come up and, and help out with their Fargo team. And I jumped at the opportunity. And, um, you know, we've kept in touch ever since then. Very cool. Um, so besides golf, uh, which, again, seems to be like something that you, you started doing more recently, uh, did you play any other sports growing up? Uh, I played soccer when I was about five years old. That, that lasted a year. And then I played baseball for a couple of years and then tried football for one one season going into sixth grade. And after that season, uh, quit every sport. Uh, so from sixth grade on, I was strictly wrestling. How did you know that you wanted to focus on wrestling exclusively at such a young age? It was uh, at a, I was very fortunate at a young age to kind of cling on to the to the um, individualized aspect of it and and being held responsible for what I put into it. Um, you know, in in other sports, I was obviously very small, and uh, you know, football really did in for me. I enjoyed it while it lasted, but you know, I realized some of those sports and, and team sports weren't for me. I enjoyed um, getting out of my performance, what I put into practice. And, and that just, uh, at a young age, very fortunate to, to cling on to wrestling. And it, it never looked back since then. Yeah. Um, off the mat, what are some of your hobbies? Obviously. Uh, so I, I got too many hobbies at the moment, but it keeps me sane. And um, golfing is a big thing when it's nice out. I golf any, any opportunity I can. Um, like to go fishing, haven't gone as much as I used to. Um, like to take my ATV out. Uh, right now it's still in the process of getting fixed. So hopefully I'll be getting that back soon so I can go ride around the snow. And then uh, my newest thing has been uh, riding around on a motorcycle, um, you know, going out in the mountains. And there's a lot of pretty views out here. So um, any any time I can get out to do something, I, I take that, that opportunity. And then, um, and it's something that when I was at the Olympic Training Center as a, I want to say a sophomore in high school, um, Terry Brands was the assistant coach there. And uh, something he was saying to the team, and it wasn't to the younger guys, he was talking to the, to the resident team at the time. And he was talking about how Bill Zadick had gone out and he fished in the streams and sit in the streams. And I, you know, that to me, that was, you know, he found it a little bit of peace and peacefulness outside of the sport and that as I got older I kind of thought I think about it more often and I it wasn't directed towards me or the or the um you know the young athletes that were there but it's something that you know I'm 30 years old now that's almost 15 years have gone by that I think about that kind of having those hobbies and and, and doing those things out on my own that you know break me away from the sport because sometimes it gets too much um in high school, all I would think about was wrestling. In my free time, I was working out, going, you know, going to practices. And now that I'm a little bit older, I take my free time a little more serious, and, um, you know, doing those active recoveries. And when I golf, I, I go out and walk the course um, and just getting out and freeing myself. So that way, when I come back in the wrestling room, I'm fully energetic and I, and I give it my all. Yeah. Uh, out of your hobbies, which do you think is the best for clearing your head? Probably golf, um, you know, riding around on the ATV or motorcycles is definitely, you know, it's, 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 it frees my mind, but golf, um, it keeps my mind working. It frees my mind from the sport of wrestling, but it keeps my mind working on, on little things. You know, I want to be, when I go out and golf, I, I want to do as good as I can. You know, I want to hit nice clean shots. So it, I got to stay disciplined in and keep my head down and, you know, and, doing the right things on a swing. So that trickles over into wrestling too. You know, sometimes I'm on the golf course and if I mess up and, you know, a little thing like picking your head up, getting too, you know, antsy on where the shot's going to go. Um, 
I think about that with wrestling too, just staying disciplined in the little things. So golf has been the best free time uh, activity I, I've enjoyed. Uh, how good are you? Uh, before I was uh, constantly in the 80s um, this summer and uh, you know about to break through into the 70s and then I blow it the last couple holes. And then uh, right before I had surgery uh, in August, I shot a 75 and a 77. So I was at peace, met my quota, wanted to see, wanted to get the 70s. So I did it and um, got my surgery. And, and now I'm looking to, as soon as the weather gets nice, go back out and hopefully pick back up where I left off. Very nice. Um, so what is your favorite food? Favorite food? Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Any specific mac and cheese? Is it like mom's mac and cheese or uh, restaurant? No, just mac a simple, cheese. simple craft, craft mac and cheese. But I, uh, I like the I uh, that. the cartoon character ones. For some reason, I just like those noodles better than the than the regular noodles. Yeah, fair enough. I remember I, I always liked the uh, the Justice League ones growing up, and I knew that they didn't actually taste any different than any of the other ones. But you know, Justice League was was my go to for okay anything with shapes. <laughs> Um, so you can be serious or you can be funny when you're answering this question, but what okay. is your biggest fear? My biggest fear? Um, probably not having control, uh, not knowing certain things, um, kind of the fear of the unknown. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, who is your favorite wrestler to watch, either past or present? Oh, uh, past, uh, probably Roberto Monzone from Cuba. My coach, uh, Willie Madison, got me hooked on him when I was at Northern Michigan. Um, just kind of his brawling style on the feet. Um, and then current moment, probably Barrero from Cuba, too. So, you know, guys that put up points, him and Stapler. Um, you know, there's a couple guys in the 67 kilo bracket that, uh, um, that I love watching, especially my teammate, Ellis. Ellis Coleman, um, you know, just the way he wrestles and, and him and I kind of both very energetic and like to wear opponents down um, a little bit differently than kind of just beating them down, just moving around and keeping the pace and tempo high. So you've done some coaching. You've, you're a member of the world-class athlete program, member of the Army. Um, do you know what you want to do after you're done competing? Yeah, I'd like to coach. Um you know, hopefully I got another two Olympic cycles in me, go till 2028. Um, I feel like from 2000, at the end of 2018, um, kind of got like a little bit of resurgence in my, in my career. Um, you know, I'm getting older in age, but um, the way I'm approaching it uh, is I feel younger. Um, so I like to wrestle, wrestle and compete for a little bit longer. And then once I'm done, um, fill out the rest of my army career, however the army sees fit. Um, you know, if I have to go on a deployment or go to another unit, you know, I'll fine with that, fill out the rest of my 20 years. And then once I'm done in the military, I'd like to open up a, a wrestling school and, and coach youth kids. Yeah. So, you know, you've been on the scene for a while, but 2019 was obviously a huge, huge year for you. You uh, broke through and made your first senior world team and, and took fifth at the senior world championships. Yeah. I think, you know, if I'm counting right, you've been to, to two world military championships, two junior worlds, three world university games. So you've done, you've had a lot of not just like international experience, but at the, the championship level. Um, how did your first senior world stack up to all the other ones you've experienced? It's been my best one. Um, and that's, like I said, when, you know, a little bit earlier, um, I'm feeling a lot better with my wrestling career now. Um, the senior world championships, that's the biggest tournament I've ever competed in in my life. And that was the first and only tournament that I went to bed both nights prior to competition at a, decent hour I was going to bed early uh usually the night before a competition I'm up till about two or three in the morning because I can't get my mind stopped working um constantly thinking about what I want to do during competitions and um the preparation that led up to it was 
by far my best. Um, you know, I didn't, nerves and everything didn't get to it because Coach Lewis, Coach Mango, Coach Robinson, Coach Brian Medlin, um, all of them kept telling me, when, and they, they didn't even, you know, it wasn't a group, um, they didn't say to me in a group, it was all individually. Um, and it really hit me when I got my Army coaches telling me one thing and then Coach Medlin at the Illinois RTC is telling me the same thing. And they're not, you know, they weren't talking to each other to try to get me on the same page. This is both, this is all their same mindset. And they were telling me to, you know, enjoy the moment and be grateful for the opportunity. And, um, you know, I took that to heart in 2018. I, you know, was thinking I was going to make the world team. Um, and I had, you know, I went into that a little bit over, over excited and it cost me. So I learned from that experience and, and I, and I enjoyed every moment of this, of the 2019 process, getting ready for the world championships. And I enjoyed the moment so much that, you know, my mood was always, I was always in a good mood. Energy was always high. Um, you know, if I was feeling a little bit sluggish, I would take the afternoon off and, and then hit it back on the next day, you know, as hard as I could. And my coaches trusted my, my, uh, my process. You know, if I told them I was a little banged up, they took my word for it, didn't question it, and let me move on because they knew they knew where my head was and you know that I was aiming to win a world you know world title. So everything that kind of came together that was that was the best experience for me. Um, and I'm looking to pick back up once you know COVID kind of dies down and we start competing again. Um, but yeah, 2019 World Championships, I was at peace with everything, uh, with my training, everything leading up to it. And didn't end the way I wanted it to, but I had no regrets. And you know, post uh, medal match interview, I said I had no regrets after that. You know, my preparation was exactly how I wanted it to be. Um, I went into it like I said. The biggest thing for me was being able to sleep at an early hour because that told me, and my mind wasn't wandering. I was ready to go um, come morning when you know weigh-ins and then competition. So um, you know, starting to get a little more peace of mind when it comes to competition time. Yeah. So obviously, you know, being with the, the Army World Class Athlete Program, um, you know, that's based in Colorado, but you're also working with the Illini RTC and Coach uh, Medlin. Could you talk a little bit about how that works? Um, so prior to COVID, it was, um, you know, it's a great little situation I had because I, I got the best room in the country right now with the world-class athlete program at Fort Carson and uh on top of that you know the first four weight classes of the of the world team were were from Army WCAP so I got guys that are in my weight area who are the best in the country and we would go at it every single day me and Ryan Mango we were, were daily practice partners and we would beat each other up and then after that we'd help each other out and it was a you know, mutual love and respecting. And then the kicker to that is now I get to every, every other month, I go out to Illinois to uh, train with Coach Medlin and, and Travis Rice and Zane Richards and, you know, some of the college guys. And um, Coach Medlin was the one that got me, uh, my, my high school coach, Neil Weiner, is the one that convinced me to do Greco when I was a senior in high school. Uh, but Brian Medlin is the one that got me hooked in, in, it made me love Greco and, and ultimately, you know, choose that lifestyle. So being able to work with a guy that got me in love with the sport and has been there since the beginning of my Greco career has been big because he know he's known me since I was a little kid. And, uh, you know, he knows the way to coach me. He knows the way to talk to me and, you know, knows my style. So I got the best of both worlds where I get to be in the, you know, in the W cap room with the best, best guys in my weight class. And then I get to go take a break and things that I'm trying out with Ryan Mangle. He, we know each other so well and, and Elder and I know each other so well and Foo Finger um, that, you know, certain, like the things that we're working on, we know what each other do. Well, we, you know, what each other one does. So when I go to Illinois and I practice with Travis, you know, I get to try out some new things and he gets to try out new things and new faces. And, you know, it's, a, it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. So how does that WCAP room dynamic change during the Olympic year? Because again, with the consolidations of the weight classes, 
you know, three three world team members, you Mango and, and Ildar, who's who's at 60 and has a bye to the Olympic team trials finals uh, after qualifying the weight class. Um, you know, how, how does that work? Do, does your do your training partners change? And I, and I mean, I'm just naming you three guys, but there's a handful of other guys too that are going to be in that 60 kilogram bracket competing for the spot. Yeah, and right now there's three of us and then Fufinger, who's number two at 60. And then we got guys like Dalton Roberts coming in. So, uh, and he was number one guy 60 the year prior. Um, but nothing changes. Um, we've got such a good relationship and good thing going on in the room that, um, like I said, we, we've all known each other for so long, especially um, Fufinger, Eldar, um, Ryan Mango and I, you know, and especially Ryan and I, we've known each other since we were in high school. Um, you know, 80 pound, 70, no, before high school, we were, you know, wrestling 70 pounds at, at preseason nationals and stuff together. So we, we know each other so well and we want to uh, see each other succeed. You know, if it's not if it's not me that, you know, makes a team, then I want one of my brothers on the team to make it and we push each other. So nothing changes. We're, we're you know, we don't duck each other. There's no ducking each other. We're our only options. And um, and we just try to make each other better. So that's the, that's the very special thing in the room that, you know, not a lot of other people are fortunate enough where you got so many guys, that, you know, especially the top three, the first top three guys in the world team all in the same weight class and we we had to deal with it when it was 59 kilos and nothing changed you know it was nice when we got to separate for a couple of years in the three different weight classes but now that we're coming back in a one weight class nothing still changes we're still going um as hard as we can with each other and outside of that you know we help each other out like hey you didn't get this because you did this and and so forth yeah so i think among athletes that have been you know, every athlete has been impacted by COVID and every athlete's training situation has been impacted by COVID, but the military athletes have been, you know, hit harder than, than just about everybody else um, in terms of limited training. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, obviously we, we, uh, we couldn't um, practice with each other um, in the room. Uh, we had a lot more strict rules, us in the, in the Marines. And, um, but that, I feel like that gave people time to, you know, our bigger guys are getting really strong, you know, so, you know, they love weightlifting and it gives people, um, the opportunity to get a little creative with their training. So I think that's what a lot of people have been doing. I see Ray Bunker always, you know, doing some, some, you know, his own things and, and he's, and he's one of those guys that's so focused and, and loves his training, but, you know, it gives you very, you know, you don't, you never have this amount of time to get creative with your training because we, before, prior to COVID, we, especially, I know myself, I was traveling every single month, whether it was a week or three weeks at a time, you know, it gave us time to kind of wind down, you know, get back to, you know, technique and, and being creative with our training, doing things that we weren't able to do in the past. So, um, you know, and, and, and then with the U.S. Open this past month or in October, um, you know, we obviously couldn't compete in it because we were just starting to train again. Um, it kind of sucked. And, you know, a lot of people are hungry. You know, you can't keep wrestlers, you know, away too long. You know, it's hard to not get your hands on somebody. You kind of go a little crazy. But I think in the end, you know, the, the time off will, will, will benefit people. Um, and then things will start to normalize and we'll get back to competing again and going back to the hectic, uh, hectic schedule. Yeah. So for you specifically, you're moving up five kilograms from 55 to 60. But post world championships, you actually kept competing at 55. You you went 60 at the Bill Farrell, which I believe you you won. You beat Mango in the finals with rock paper scissors. No, he beat me because I won. He, I, was, you, I couldn't I was, remember. I was there. I knew someone won rock paper scissors. I couldn't. I was stupid. I went scissors twice. Don't go the same <laughs> one twice. <laughs> Um, so, so anyways, so in your, in your one, or in your tournament at 60, you make the finals, you know, strong showing, and then you competed at 55 for the Pan Ams, the Mateo Pelicon, and the Haparanda. Um, could you talk about your decision to do that? And, you know, is 60 kilograms a stretch for you to get up to? Yeah. So my natural weight is between 59 and 60 kilos, um, and my decision to do both is is strictly for competition. 
And um, when I talked to Timmy Hands at Five Point Move about it, you know, I was telling him a lot of people were, were giving me a lot of crap for it. Like, why are you going 50? You're wasting your time going 55 if, if the Olympics is, is 60, you know, and that's the biggest thing. And I was like, yeah, but if I go 60 kilo, if I try to go 60 kilos, I'm not going on these trips. So, um, you know, wrestling at New York, um, I wasn't at, supposed to wrestle in New York. I had gotten, um, I had to get uh, some stuff done with my hips and it, I, uh, we were already planning on going to Georgia and, in Sweden after that. So I was already in New York and I told coach Robinson to sign me up and he's like, I already did. So I wrestled and, uh, you know, glad I did. Cause I was able to get four matches out of that. And then, you know, um, and then Ryan Mango and I did rock, paper, scissors. And like I said, people weren't too happy about that. Um, but we practiced with each other every single day and we were about to go on a, on a month long trip after that. So, you know, to us, it was just, uh, it, it, we saw no point in it because, you know, the biggest thing is Olympic trials and we're prepping up for it. And then the next day, you know, you got two Penn State guys going at it and uh, and one of them gets hurt. It was, I think, Vincenzo, Joseph and uh, Nickel. I Nolf. think Nolf. And Nolf got hurt, right? Hurt his knee. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, and you know, you hate to see things like that happen, but like I said, Ryan and I wrestle with each other every day and, and we're thinking about Olympic team trials. And um, so then we went on, on, on trips after that and, and going 55 was my only option to, to get matches and, and to get funded. Um, you know, USA Wrestling didn't fund the, any of the trips. I post After the World Championships, all those trips were funded either through the Army's World Class Athlete Program and then Pan Am's was funded by the Illinois RTC. So in order for me to get those matches, I had to go 55 kilos and, and get that competition. And to me, getting competition matches was more important than, than staying in the, in the practice room and, and trying to get bigger. But, you know, I tried to get bigger when I was 59 kilos and I couldn't, you know, 59, 60, that's my natural weight. And um, I just needed to get matches. And that, that was my decision to do, to do both 55 and 60 the past year. So last week, USA Wrestling announced that they were not going to field the team for the 2020 World Championships. Uh, it elicited a variety of responses from the athletes. Last week, you spoke to Tim Hands, a uh, five-point move, and you said you personally were in favor of the decision not to attend. Uh, could you maybe explain your rationale and uh, where you're coming from? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not not afraid to share my opinion about it. It... Um, I wrote a strongly disagree throughout the board and uh, or throughout the survey. And my reasoning for that was, uh, you know, they're trying to throw uh, world championships in between, you know, the Olympic games. Um, you know, we're the only continental uh, championships that completed for the, for the final spots on our side. Um, so they still have the European and Asian champion or Asian championships and last chance qualifier. So, I, I believe that right now, um, you know, it's not the right time still to uh, travel overseas to, to uh, compete. And, you know, the numbers keep fluctuating up and down with COVID. And um, I think throwing the world championships and potentially exposing the athletes isn't worth that risk. I think, you know, we should, especially with it being a contact sport, USA Wrestling put the U.S. Open on in, in October, and I think they did a great job um, the way it was ran. Um, but that's that's domestically, and they were able to control a lot of variables in, in you know, very, very greatly. But when you talk about an international competition, you know, especially in a country where, where the numbers were rising, um, I felt like it wasn't safe for us to go, um, whether – we were, you know, the military took a little bit longer for us to start compete or training again, whether we're training and competing or not. I feel like overall for the, for the United States, it wasn't um, in our best benefit or, you know, um, and like I said, the main focus should be 2021 uh, Tokyo and hope, hopefully that those games go on. And, um, you know, something Bruce Bender brought up in one of the AAC meetings and, and I agree with him completely is, you know, in 2016, we weren't, we were almost not going to compete in Rio. Um, you know, we had a fight for, for that to get back in 2013, 2014, and we fought our way back in. And, um, you know, with us being a contact sport, I think we need to play a little more cautiously. And, um, you know, tw uh, the Olympics should always be held the highest. Um, 
among, you know, just throwing a world championships in there. And like I said, you know, we're the only continental championships that have completed our Olympic uh, spots, you know, qualifier tournament. So they still have to do the Europeans and Asians and uh, the African championships. So um, I feel like all that needs to be done first and then everything kind of needs, you know, be brought back to normal before we start uh, throwing ourselves out there internationally. All right. Hey, thanks for sharing your opinion on that, Max. I, I mm -hmm. appreciate it. Um, you've been doing this a while. What do you think is the best piece of advice you've ever received or a piece of advice that sticks out to you after all these years? Um, kind of being, being honest with yourself, you know, and, and like I said, um, what got me hooked on the sport is, is, is the, uh, individualized and, and keeping your, keeping yourself accountable. If you want to succeed in this sport, then you learn how to keep yourself accountable. Um, you know, and then you find a great group of guys that will keep you accountable too. You know, I got teammates that, that keep me accountable and coaches that keep me accountable. So I think just being, being held, you know, learning how to keep yourself accountable in this sport and that trickles off to academics and, and your outside life. So, um, that, and just, and really having fun. You hear all these older athletes say having fun and, and it doesn't hit you until, you know, later on in life where once you enjoy practices and that's when you're getting the most out of it, that's when your energy level's high. Um, you know, you're not dreading going into practice, you know, um, dragging your feet into practice. So having fun and, and getting the most out of it, you know, and sometimes you don't get that until you're a little bit older. Yeah, I was, well, I was going to ask a, a similar question. What would your advice be to someone that's just starting out in the sport? Um, definitely having fun, you know, not taking it too seriously, but also um, it's, it's always listen, listen and, and always try to learn. Um, and when I was younger, there was there was times where, um, you know, I didn't see this coach as valuable as another coach. I kind of, you know, nodded it off and wouldn't pay too much attention and then uh the next year I ended up becoming very close to that coach that kind of just you know waved off to the side and and that's when I learned to you know even even if what someone's telling you isn't something that you do it's not your style you can still always pick something off you know coach Byers is is a heavyweight coach and and when he talks to us in the room um there when he's talking about a straight lift there are things that obviously are different between the way a, a lighter guy tries a straight lift and a bigger guy. But um, sitting down and actually l looking and listening to what he's saying and doing, I picked up a, a, a way he that he locks his hands and the way he does certain things. So always being being receptive to any piece of advice for learning. Maybe sometimes, you know, it doesn't work for you. It doesn't work for you, but you gave it a chance. You gave it, you know, you gave it the opportunity to listen it out. So, you know, always being receptive and, and always being willing to learn. You always have to be willing to learn, whether it's in wrestling or in life. Um, during, you know, your toughest training sessions or, you know, when you're pushing to get more, one more rep or one more sprint, uh, what do you use as, as motivation for yourself? Uh, family and friends. Um, you know, I always want – I never want to let them down, never want to let my coaches down. Um, you know, that, that's something that when it gets hard, that's what I think about. You know, when I was when I was younger, my uh, mom and dad worked two jobs at the same time to get me to Fargo, to get me to overtime school of wrestling, which was the best uh, youth club in the, in the country at the time. You know, so having those great opportunities because my parents sacrificed a lot for me to do that. You know, that 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 one reminder right there is is, is probably the, the biggest thing that that goes into my, the back of my mind when, you know, it's getting a little hard. All right. And last quest question I got for you, Max. Uh, what is your best wrestling memory to date? Best wrestling memory to date? Um, it's probably, probably two. Um, uh, first one is, is make my first uh, senior world team. That's... Uh, you know, highlight of my life, you know, the first one, um, but making the national team in 2017, uh, that was probably second closest because at that time, 
Um, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to keep competing. Um, and I had talked about this on an interview at five point move, um, from 2000 and third from 2014, 2016, I was a constant fifth place finisher and, you know, it's getting very aggravating and, and disappointing. And I didn't want to waste my coach's time or, you know, my training partner's time. So I was thinking about moving on and, um, you know, when I finally broke through that barrier a little bit, that gave me a lot more uh, motivation to keep going. And because of that, I stuck around and, uh, you know, 55 kilos came back and, and I was able to start doing things with my career again. So those two things, um, big and big for me. Awesome. Well, Max, thanks for, for coming on and sharing some insight and uh, a little bit about yourself. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you taking the time and, and doing this. Oh, yeah, you got it. Well, this has been another edition of Team USA Tuesday. I'm Mike Willis for Max Nowry. Thanks for tuning in.